this playlist deals with some aspects of Eurocode 2 version 2023. Watch this channel for further selected topics. This video will be about clause 9, the serviceability limit state. And in more detail, we will look at section 9.2.3 uh, about refined control of cracking and an edge restraint. In 9.2.3, section 1, it is stated that the calculated crack width, WK, Tal, given in 9.23, should only be considered as a nominal value for the crack width at the member surface to be compared with W limit Tal and not as a value actually measured on site. So now it's very clear that the calculated crack width is a nom nominal value and it has nothing to do with the real value that you measure on site. The formula 9.8 uh, explains you the calculation of the crack width. We see immediately that if you compare it with the version of 2004, that two factors are added to the formula. WK tal is the calculated surface crack width. KW is in fact a factor converting the mean crack width into a calculated crack width, and it's 1.7. K1 over R is in fact a factor to account for the increase of crack width due to curvature. And at the most tensioned side of the section, this factor k1 over r is equal to what is stated in here in this formula and on the least tension side with x is negative here then you uh, can approximate k1 over r with the formula as stated in 9.10 srm cal is the calculated mean crack spacing and is given by formula 9.14. We see immediately that there is a lower limit on the value of SRM cal, which is a function of h minus x. We can wonder now what will happen if you are in pure tension. Then the x is minus infinity. And it means that this is a very large number. And it means that this limit disappears because every value that's on the left-hand side of the equation will fulfill this inequality. KB, it's a, a factor that's reflecting the bond between the reinforcement and the concrete. KFLA, is in fact the factor that um, uh, represents the effect of the curvature to the crack width opening. You will remember from the previous videos that in AC effective, the area, the effective area of concrete around the bar in tension, that the mean concrete tensile strength is equal to a proportional factor kafle multiplied by FCTM or FCT effective. So this uh, uh, factor KFL is given by formula 9.17. Xe in this formula is in fact the same as Xg and it's the depth of the neutral axis of an uncracked section. Kw is 1.7. And the diameter V uh, is just the, di the diameter of the rebar. But if you use in one layer different sizes of rebars, then you should use the equi equivalent diameter, which is given by this formula 
Now let's make a comparison with Eurocode version 2004, and we will make a comparison for bending and good bond. Comparison for the calculated uh, main track spacing, of course. So for bending and good bond, then for uh, good bond, KB is 0.9, and for uh, bending, K flat, we will uh, adopt uh, point, uh, 0 0.5. Then you will see that this uh, formula 9.15 uh, leads to this expression. And the uh, mean uh, crack spacing, uh, according to the version of 2004, leads to this expression. We see now the difference between those two, and we can ask why. Why is now the mean, the calculated mean crack spacing different than it was in the past? Well, we, we, we must. Um, uh, look at the form at the formula of the of of uh, calculating w the crack width of calculating the crack width then we see immediately that we have two additional uh, factors in it if you compare it with the version of 2004 and kw is 1.7 k1 over r you can estimate more or less a mean factor of 1.25 and you will arrive at 2.1 so that's in fact a little bit the difference between those two. So you have now a much smaller uh, mean crack spacing because this was not included. In the present Eurocode 2004, you have uh, SR max, which is uh, uh, this three uh, factors together. The factor uh, rho rho effective, uh, which is the ratio of, of the reinforcement, uh, is equal to the total reinforcement that you find within the zone AC effective. And for the uh, pre-stressing pre reinforcement, you multiply it by an adjusted ratio for bond strength. AC effective is equal to BC effective times AC effective, see video 17 and 19 in this place, playlist where we explained this. And uh, we can here for the ease of use repeat the formulas. We have seen that we can reformulate the uh, value of AC effective in this way, which is easier to use. And uh, this now is a picture for bending only, but if you have tension only, then it's just this portion that is coming on top too. So it's the same formula. For beams, the formulas for BC effective, the effective width is also uh, converted into a more easier way of using, uh, of, of use of the formulas. And it depends on the uh, distance of the reinforcement AX. And when it's smaller than five times the diameter, then you've got this equation. And when it's bigger than five times the diameter, you have this equation. In this equation, there is a factor S, which is the distance center to center of the rebars. And for a beam, it is, of course, given by this simple formula. When you have only uh, uh, one layer of reinforcement. For slabs, BC effective, this, for slabs, this will lead to BC effective is the minimum, which is this uh, drawing, is a minimum of 10 and phi or B. It's, it's the minimum of the two. Delta epsilon is in fact the difference in mean strain of reinforcement on concrete. And now we can have uh, we must make a distinction between end restraint and edge restraint. End restraint means that when Z, which is the the, the height or the depth of of of, uh, of the structure, is bigger than L over two, which is this distance L over two. These are the three uh, uh, boundaries of the slab, and you see when Z is bigger than L of two, you are in the top portion, it means that you have, in fact, a concrete element which is retained 
at the end. So it is end restraint and you have a crack which is doing that. For edge restraint, Z is smaller than L over 2. It means you are in the lower part of this structure. So this is restraint, this and this is restraint. So then you have an edge restraint element. And depending on if it's end or edge restraint, you will have a different delta epsilon. For direct loads or end restraint. So if you have an element like this, on top, or you have an element that is loaded with direct loads, then you use formula 9.11. End restraint is used in minimum reinforcement because direct loads is always according to this formula. For the ease of use, I multiplied both uh, left and right hand side of the equation with uh, the modulus of elasticity of the reinforcement, then you will see that the uh, delta epsilon times ES gives you the uh, uh, tensile strength in the reinforcement minus this well-known coefficient here. There's, all, there's also in delta epsilon, there is a uh, lower limit. So the Delta epsilon must always be bigger than 1 minus kT times sigma s. Now we will look into the different elements of this formula. First of all, sigma s. Sigma s is the stress in tension reinforcement closest to the tension concrete surface, assuming cracked section. So it's the stress in the tension reinforcement closest to the tension concrete surface. So when you have Two layers of reinforcement, sigma s is the tension in the layer of reinforcement closest to the surface. This is for direct loads. When you are in a situation of end restraint, then of course you do not have that uh, load coming from, from, from the outside. So you, the stress in the tension reinforcement from the sectional cracking forces is then equal to sigma s. Alpha e. Alpha e is the uh, proportion of the ratio of the modus of elasticity of steel to the concrete. The mean uh, modus of elasticity to the concrete is stated here in this. Now, the, this formula is in fact in contradiction with, uh, point nine, with formula 9.1, because the crack width calculations are done in the serviceability limit state Q. So it means long-term calculations. And in 9.1 states that the effective modulus of elasticity equals 1.05 ECM divided by one plus phi, the creep factor. So this is violates in fact, the formula 9.1, because it was clearly stated in 9.1 that you have to adapt your modulus of elasticity when you are calculating on a long-term basis with creep. So in this formula, where is the creep? There is no creep anymore. If, if you act, accept what, what the code says, A is divided not by EC, but by ECM without the fee, without the creep coefficient, then I got a problem with it. There's no creep. The answer or, or, or a possible explanation is that there is a KT factor in, and this KT factor is a factor for long-term calculation or short-term calculation. So the long-term calculation, which is the creep, and the factor of the creep, is already inside this factor kT. So the reasoning is that alpha must not take count of the creep, because otherwise you would have taken two times creep into account. That's the first reason. The second reason is that the effect of creep on the crack width is neglectable. That's what the background document says. But Trost said in a paper in 1991 that there is an H-adjusted effective modulus method. 
So for this means, and this is what Trust uh, 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 introduced, he said, EC effective, the effective model of elasticity is the mean model of elasticity divided by one plus phi or one plus k times phi. It's 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 one it's one of, one of the other. So you should ad, um, adapt the modus of elasticity of concrete when there is creep. So what we've seen in the previous slide, I truly do not agree with alpha e equals es divided by ecm, but um, uh, it is stated like that in the code. KT is a coefficient dependent on duration and nature of load. And I will state it like it is in the code. It says KT is equal to 0.6 for short term loading and instantaneous loading. Okay, and instantaneous loading is also a short term loading. But then it's getting very confusing. It says it's for long term too, but for in the crack formation stage. And it is for repeated loading also in the crack formation stage. So repeated loading can also be long-term or short-term, but both are in the crack formation stage. KT is 0.4 in the long-term, but in the stabilized cracking stage. And it's also for repeated loading, but this time in the stabilized cracking stage. Now, how do you know when you are in the stabilized cracking stage or in the crack formation stage? In the crack formation stage, sigma s is equal to f y k, the yield strength. And in the stabilized cracking stage, sigma s is smaller than f y k. So, but as a designer, you have to de you have to decide what factor do will I use, so you don't know in which uh, cracking phase or or you are. So this is a little bit confusing, maybe. The explanation can be clear, but 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 and, and we understand why this is, but but it's very difficult to apply it uh, directly when you are calculating the crack width. So I strongly propose just to use kt equals 0.6 in a short-term loading and use kt equals 0.4 in a long-term situation, and we will adopt. Overall, we will uh, uh, we will accept that when it's long term, you are always in a stabilized cracking stage. So when you do a long term calculation, and you know by sure because you have done other calculation that you are in a crack formation stage, then you should switch from KT to from 0.4 to 0.6. But in in normal cases, you can adopt short term 0.6, long term 0.4. Now let's go back to our uh, picture of end restraint and edge restraint. Now we can, <clears throat> when you have restraint imposed strains and edge restraint, this side. So it means here at the bottom. So imposed strains and edge restraint. Then you will see that delta epsilon is a different formula, 9.13, and it's air up. R A X epsilon three minus uh, uh, por portion def de depending on the long term or the uh, short term uh, factor K T. In Eurocode three part three in uh, section M three, delta epsilon was in this case only equal to R times epsilon. So now you will see there is some when you have a free uh, 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 rain uh, acting or, or, or possible acting on your element, you can subtract the strain that causes cracking. It makes sense. It makes it makes sense in this in, uh, because when the concrete is not cracked yet, then you do not have uh, um, crack width calculation. But this gives a huge difference if you compare it with the formula in M3 in Eurocode 2 part 3. RAX is the restraint factor, 
and the restraint factor is explained in Annex B of Eurocode uh, 2023, and it's equal to one minus epsilon restraint divided by epsilon imposed. You can you can calculate if you have enough data to 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 do it, but in most cases you do not have enough data. So, but you will see that there is more or less a maximum to it, to it and it is 0.5 in most cases. So taking RAX as 0.5 is not a big mistake. Epsilon free is the imposed train. How do we calculate that in this formula? Because that's a very important factor. So how do you calculate the imposed strain? One way to do it is you, you take the summation of the basic shrinkage plus the drying shrinkage plus the temperature shrinkage, which is uh, caused by the hydration of the concrete. Then you will see basic screen shrinkage is given by Bohr formula B24 in Annex B, drying shrinkage in formula B25, and temperature shrinkage. It depends, of course, of the type of curing, of the type of concrete, and so on. Um, in most cases, you will have a delta uh, T of temperature of 15 degrees. So uh, if you do not know this, if you don't know exactly where, where, uh, what, what value to take, then 150 microstrain will be a good figure to, to, to start with. In total, an imposed strain between 500 and 600 microstrain that is what your structure should be able to take. So if you do, do not know to calculate all those trains or it is un, uncertain, then make sure that your structure can take 500 to 600 micro strains as an imposed strain. Minimum reinforcement for imposed deformation, edge restraint. We can now from equations from the equations that we've seen in the previous slides 9 8 9 30 9 15 we can now give an example of calculation with a good bond and in pure tension k is one and kt is zero it will give you uh, an upper bound well rearranging those formulas you can uh, uh, rearrange it to the factor rho, which is AS divided by AC effective. And this is for the version of 2023. So it gives you the reinforcements ratio, depending on the concrete cover, the diameter of reinforcement that you use, the uh, crack width, uh, the maximum crack width that you allow, the uh, um, uh, factor Rx, which is most of the time 0.5, and your free train. We can do the same for the Eurocode in 2004, and you see that it is a very similar formula, but you have different coefficients, and it's also rho rho effective is As divided by AC effective. Now, make sure that this AC effective of 2004 is different them from the AC effective of 2023. We can now give an example. So an example of calculating the needed reinforcement for a, a restraint uh, uh, deformation or an imposed deformation, edge restraint for a concrete cover of 30 millimeters and a restraining factor of 0.5, the wall or the slab is uh, 30, 300 millimeters in depth and we calculate it by, by one meter width. The limiting imposed uh, crack width is 0.15 millimeter and an epsilon free of 500 micro strain. The uh, location of the reinforcement, it's one layer, then you can have 30, so it's in the first layer. So the the position of the reinforcement is 30 plus, of course, phi over 2. It means one layer with the same diameter. Now we can make some calculations for Eurocode of 2023. We start with uh, AC effective. You can put it in this formula. It's a function of the diameter. We take here BC effective equals to B, 
we'll come back to that just now, eh, which is one meter for Eurocode 2004. If you calc when you're calculating AST effective, you got this formula. And now you will calculate uh, the needed reinforcement for restraint deformation, which is, of course, the ratio rho times AC effective. You can put it into one formula, and you will see this is a formula as a function of the diameter of the rebars. And you are, have a similar formula for 2004. You, you see that the needed reinforcement is not just uh, it's not just one one number, so you have to put in different numbers. You you take the minimum uh, diameter, which is eight. Then you have AS required by putting eight in this formula. You will have a 240 square millimeter per meter, and then we go to AS provided. So we have to put five diameters eight, which is 251. Then we do the same with a diameter 10, and then the same with a diameter 12. And you will see then the different values of AS provided and AS required. We can do exactly the same with uh, the formula for Eurocode 2004. And there you will see, for instance, for diameter 8, we have already 464 square millimeters needed, so you need 10 diameters 8, or you need 8 diameters 10, or you need 7 diameters 12. You see immediately that in, for the formula in 2023, you need for restraint deformation much less reinforcement than with the present Eurocode. Here we have taken BC effective equals to B, 2000. Now, let's suppose we are just following the code like it is written. Then BC effective is 10 N phi. You can plug it in the formula of rho, eh? then you get that the reinforcement is equal to this formula with VC effective equals to 10 and phi. Looking at this, then you know the required reinforcement must be smaller than the provided reinforcement. We have n rebounds of equal diameter phi, so this is n times this. When, when looking at this equation, you see immediately that n phi, phi squared you can you can you can delete it and you arrive at an equation phi must be smaller than 30 millimeters so when you use bc effective as is stated in you in, uh, in in the code 2023 you end up with the minimum required reinforcement for entry restraint is diameter smaller than 30 millimeters so it's independent of n do you put one bar, two bars, three bars? It doesn't matter. You always fulfill the inequality here, always, because the n is on both sides of the equation. So this is clearly nonsense. This is not right. So that's why we will use BC effective equal to B.